Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Sabbath School Commentary. You're here with Matt Parra. I have the privilege of spending time with you this week considering this week's lesson, which is entitled Rebirth of Planet Earth. The quarterly starts with a really cool story of a kid who's in school and who decides that he's not going to continue to go to school because he just finished reading a book on astronomy that taught him that in the distant future, our sun that powers our solar system is going to burn out and all life in the solar system is going to come to its end. Well, after reading that, the kid was a bit kind of discouraged and he reasoned to the conclusion that if in the end, everything was just going to burn out, everything was just going to fade away, what was the purpose of him going to school and studying and preparing for life and for a career in this world when the eventual end is complete annihilation and non-existence? You know, it's not a bad point. What is the purpose of living a life when that life and all life is going to amount to nothing at all. Human beings are too reasonable, we're too logical to, to, to do that. The lesson points out that there's good news because that story is not the true story. That there is a God and there is a plan. And his intention, God's intention, is to create a new heaven and a new earth. And so we're gonna jump right into Sunday's lesson, which was entitled, new heavens and new earth and it focuses us in on verses 17 through 25 in Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65 verses 17 through 25 and I'm actually going to read these verses with you. So I'm in Isaiah 65 and I'm reading verses 17 through 25. Listen to this. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the voice of crying or the sound of crying. No longer will they, there be an infant in it who lives just a few days or an old man who does not live out his days for the youth will die at the age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They'll build houses and inhabit them. They'll also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people, and my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord." Isaiah does something in this passage that's quite common to his writings and to the writings of Old Testament prophets. He mingles together a prophecy that is local to his time and place with an end time apocalyptic prophecy. This happens very often. He ultimately is talking about a time in the future where God actually creates a new heavens and a new earth. And in that place, no, there's no death, there's no sorrow, there's no mourning, there's no crying, none. And in that place, animals that once ate other animals will not eat other animals anymore. That's finished. 
That's done. Lions become herbivores, and oh boy, the wildebeests are happy. And people that function like predators won't be there. No, no, no. Well, the ones that will be there will be converted and changed because of the faith that they had in Christ and the love they had for the kingdom of heaven. At the same time, you see that Isaiah is also talking about the restored Israelite nation. And God says he's going to restore Jerusalem. And so you see Jerusalem, Israel is going to be in a condition where its old men live long lives and where less children die. This is what God is saying. Now, I just want to interject here just real quick in my commentary on this passage of scripture and in my teaching on this passage of scripture. There was a man who spent his life ministering to a group of native people in Papua New Guinea. It was actually called Western Irian Jaya when he was there. And it was a Dutch colony at the time. He was a Canadian man and he went to minister to the Sawi people. And the Sawi were cannibalistic headhunters. And these cannibalistic headhunters had perfected the art of betrayal. They were masters at betraying people. Betrayal had become a part of their culture and it became a virtue in their culture. So what they had idealized is befriending a person and gaining that person's trust and confidence. And then after that person had committed to you complete confidence, complete trust, you'd kill them and you'd eat them, but you'd kill them slowly so that you could watch them in their horror at the fact that you were killing them. This, this was a virtue. This was, this was how you became famous in Sawi culture. They were treacherous people. Their culture had perfected treachery. So much so that, that when this man preached the gospel to them and he read scripture to them, they got really excited about Judas. They thought, this guy's got it right. That Jesus guy, what a chump, what a sucker, what a fool. This is what this man, this missionary man, was dealing with. And anyways, you may or may not know the story. The book was called The Peace Child. And those of you guys who know the book, I talk about it all the time. It's one of the books that I've read in the last five years that have, that's impacted me the most. He actually found in their cultural framework this tradition of exchanging children when you had a conflict that you wanted to resolve. And so the way their custom worked was that since you couldn't make peace any other, like they just couldn't make peace because they had idealized treachery, right? So if you pay someone off or if you bring someone a gift, that person that you're trying to pay off or bring a gift because of something you've done wrong to them or something that they've done wrong to you or whatever, they're just going to think you're trying to gain their confidence so that you can eat them. So it becomes very hard in their culture to get along, right? To just not kill each other and not be really wary about other people. But they had this tradition called the tradition of the peace child. So if you wanted to make peace, you had to take your firstborn son and you had to give it to your enemy. And your enemy had to take his firstborn son and he had to give it to you. And you would raise his son as if his son was your son and your son would be raised by him as if he was your enemy's son. And so this would bring peace and no one would ever betray the right of the peace child. It was the worst thing. And as long as the child was alive, well, then there was peace. And so the missionary, he communicated through the culture of the Sawi people, the gospel, and said, you see, Judas is not the hero because God and humankind were alienated from one another and, and they were at odds. And then, so the father God, he gave his only son as a peace child, just like the Sawi people give their sons to their enemies so that they can become friends. And once the Sawi understood this and once they, they got this, they began to accept the truth of Jesus Christ and the Lordship of Jesus and the love of God that is offered through the gospel. So uh, very powerful, very amazing. Now you're asking, well, Matt, you said that this was going to be a small interjection into the story and so, or into your teaching on Isaiah chapter 65. That's what you're going on here. Well, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not off track. <laughs> this missionary, many years after leaving Western Irian Jaya, 
he came back to visit many times, but I've, I just saw a video on YouTube where he came back to visit 20 years later. And in an interview, he says that the first thing that he notices when he gets off the plane and meets the Sawi welcoming committee, he meets all the Sawi people who are congregated there to celebrate his arrival. He said the first thing that he noticed was how many old people there were there. And he said, when I first, as a young man, with my son and my wife, traveled into the jungles of Western area in Jaya, he said, there were no old people. When I met the Sawi the first time, there were no old people. Nobody lived that long. They all died. And so the value system of that culture did not allow for people to grow old. There was too much violence. There was too much bloodshed. And so God here in Isaiah 65 is saying, the same thing's gonna happen in Israel. So God is mingling together, or he is blending together through Isaiah's prophecy, the future prediction of the restoration of all things, how the world is going to be reborn and remade. But he also teaches about how Israel as a nation is going to be reborn and remade. And he talks, he uses the positive condition of the Israelite nation as a metaphor through which we can see what things will be like at the end of time. And so there's ample evidence in this text to see this text is speaking through the restoration of Israel to the fulfillment of all of God's promises and the restoration of the human race on a new earth that has new heavens, that's completely remade. It's fascinating to consider the fact that once human beings are granted immortality, when we're able to, we're not granted immortality as if God will ever make us immortal, but this mortal, according to 1 Corinthians 15, will put on immortality, and this corruptible will put on incorruption. When that happens, when the human race is fully transitioned into the glory that God intends for us to enjoy and to share, then the world itself is also going to be remade, which is a, is a powerful thought to consider. There's something the lesson doesn't bring out that, that just jumps out at me when I consider the fact that God is going to create new heavens and a new earth. When I look at the scripture, when I, when I look at the, the collection of books that we call the Bible, and I consider everything that it has to say about the restoration of the human race, and in the salvation or the redemption of the human race. When I look at the whole scope of scripture, I see God creating the world perfectly, the world falling into sin and becoming corrupt on a moral and physical level. So the moral corruption of man affects the physical world and the world follows humanity into corruption. And the Bible says in Romans chapter eight that the whole creation, it's groaning in anguish and in pain and it's waiting in eager expectation for the transformation of the human race. And the implication is that when the human race finally becomes what God destined it to be, then so will plant it, planet Earth. Now, in Isaiah 66, you see the promise of the new heavens and the new earth, but then you also see this local promise of Jerusalem being restored, and then these positive promises given to Jerusalem based on their moral and spiritual restoration in God. When the people of God are restored, then the creation of God is restored. And this is a central message in Isaiah 65 that we've got to take with us. The spring from which physical evil in the world flows from is the spring of moral evil. And so sin, when it is fully conceived, brings forth death, James says. And so we understand that once humanity is restored, then the whole world is restored. You see this happening locally in the context of the fallen world, and you're going to see it at the end of time in the context of God recreating the whole planet. Further to this, the work of redemption is a creative act. So when I look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, I, I see God himself through the person of Jesus recreating the human race. So Jesus comes down, he manifests himself in physical flesh and blood. He lives perfectly, the life of perfect obedience to the law of God. And the law of God is the law of life, and it's the law of love, and it's the law that Adam abandoned and Eve abandoned. And, and Jesus succeeds in his life where Adam failed. He lives a virtuous life, a pure life, a holy life. And then God lays upon him the iniquity of us all. God makes him to be sin for us. So throughout the life of Jesus, Jesus is an embodiment of the kingdom of heaven. 
And he says in Luke 17 and verse 20, hey, you guys are saying, look here, look there, because you're looking for the kingdom of God. But behold, the kingdom of God is among you. That's the Greek render. The Greek literally renders that text. The kingdom of God is among you, not within you. It's among you. And when he says it's among you, what he means is, is I am the embodiment of God's kingdom. So Jesus is the embodiment of God's kingdom throughout the course of his whole life. But then God makes him to be sin for us and he becomes the embodiment, not of the kingdom of heaven, but the embodiment of the kingdom of hell. And God lays upon him the iniquity of us all. And Jesus, he walks forward step by step and he treads the winepress of the wrath of almighty God. He suffers as a guilty He suffers as if he were guilty. He is punished as if he were guilty. He ends up, he makes himself the substitute for the human race. And he pays the price for our redemption. We were not redeemed with silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Christ. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins because the law is just, holy, and it's good. And if God were to let the sinner off the hook, well then guess what? That that impugns his law, that impugns his law. And the law then is just seen as arbitrary, not essential, not really righteous. Um, So God lays the sin of the world on Jesus and he dies a perfect death, never cursing, never hating, but only unselfishly giving. So just as he lived, he died, unselfish perfect unselfishness, perfect commitment to the law and love of God. And as he dies, he dies the same way. Now death and sin could have no power over him. This is told to us in Acts chapter two. He could not be held down by death because he himself as an individual person did not sin. And the strength of sin is the law. And if a person hasn't broken the law, they have the right to life. And so Jesus, he had the right to life. And so he was resurrected. He was brought forward from the grave. He had power to lay his life down and he had power to raise it up again. And so he enters into flesh and blood humanity to take Adam's place. And he lives the life that Adam failed to live. And then he dies in Adam's place and in your place and in my place. And then he is resurrected again on our behalf. And know you not that we who have been baptized, we were baptized into his death. The Bible says, and if one died for all, then all were dead. All have all died in him, in the person of Jesus. We have all died in the person of Jesus. And if we we believe that by faith, uh, we are given the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will guide us home. We follow Jesus from here to eternity. And so now here's the point. I'm, I'm saying, I'm narrating a bit of my understanding of the gospel to you. I'm communicating a bit of my understanding of the gospel because I'm supporting my premise that the work of redemption or the redemption of the human race was a work of recreation. So stage one, of recreating humanity was Jesus's incarnation and life, perfect life. So you could just say stage one, the perfect life. Stage two, the perfect death on the cross, the perfect offering up of himself on the cross on behalf of the human race to atone for the sins of the world. And then he's resurrected and his resurrection is in effect the resurrection of the whole human race. And he goes then and becomes the intercessor of the human race, the high priest of the human race in the heavenly sanctuary. And he ministers before God in the true tabernacle that God made, not man, the one that the Old Testament sanctuary of the Jews was a copy of, was a shadow of. And those priests there who ministered in that tabernacle, they were just ministering as a copy, as a shadow. They're prefiguring the true ministry of the true priest. And that's Jesus the righteous. And so he stands on behalf of the human race and, and he send, and he works in partnership with the Holy Spirit to send us the virtue of his life, the absolution and forgiveness that his death provides and the spirit that his intercession affords. He gives that all to us now. And this is all the work of recreation. Now, stage one, perfect life. Stage two, perfect death. Stage three, perfect intercession. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And he's a much better intercessor than those earthly priests. And the Bible talks about this in the book of Hebrews, especially between chapters five, six, and seven, and eight. He's a far superior high priest than any human sinful man by the virtue of his eternal life, his self-existence. He's God and he's man. That's the next stage in the recreation of humanity. And then the last stage is the transformation of the righteous at the end of time. And then the recreation of the world for them to inhabit just powerful. So the world is part and parcel to the work of redemption and God redeeming humankind affects the redemption of the planet itself. And the question we ask ourselves is that are we 
partakers of the divine nature through Jesus Christ and through the precious promises of the Word of God. I want the gift of repentance, Lord Jesus, and I hope that all of you listening do as well. Because what's the point of hearing the word, but not doing it? And so, Lord Jesus, we want you to live out your life within us so that we could truly be converted now and forever. And uh, as in Isaiah 65, when Jerusalem is restored, then the world is restored. And that is a basic message from this text. When the people of God are restored, then the world around them is restored. And this is a fault of, of ours in the modern world. It's so hilarious when I watch the social reformers of our age. They're running around wagging their fingers at everyone else, talking about the grand injustices of the system or the structural injustices of the Western world and blah, blah, blah. So they're running around critiquing governmental systems while they themselves are not sinless, are not faultless, are basically, they're just as much to blame because they're partakers of the same supposedly unjust systems that they take aim at. And the Bible's solution is not you run around and fix the externals and then all the internals will kind of work themselves out. No, the Bible solution is you fix your heart, you fix your mind, and then the rest of the world will follow. Like think of Jesus, like he's not politicking against Rome. That's what Judas wanted him to do. Barabbas was the one who was arrested for sedition, who was getting political and going after Rome on a physical level. And you see all these crusaders marching in the streets with their black masks, like they're like militiamen, and they're gonna take over this evil government. And it's like, what about your evil heart, you sinner? You know, those sins that you condemn in others are not, it's not as if you don't have the same nature and mindset and flaws. Every governmental system is the external expression of people's hearts. And so start working on changing people's hearts and minds. And the only way that that happens is through repentance in Jesus' name, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, it's from the heart that proceeds murders, thefts, adulteries, licentiousness, and all kinds of uncleanliness. I will give you a new heart. That's what the Bible says. And Isaiah 65 is kind of chiming in on that concept. Once Jerusalem's fixed, now the world will get fixed. So anyways, we could go on there. So I'm just going to spend just a brief moment talking to you about some things that Monday's lesson brings up, and then we're going to end the commentary because I want to keep this short and sweet. The point of this commentary is not to comment on everything the lesson has to say, but just to highlight some key sentiments and key thoughts and to get you guys fired up for the study of God's Word and the study of the lesson, to promote the lesson as a really powerful tool for us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ together as a church family. Monday's lesson is entitled Divine Magnet, and it focuses in on Isaiah 66, 1 through 19. We're not going to read that passage, but I'm going to read just a piece of it here with you guys, okay? So Isaiah 66, beginning in verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place I may rest? Now, this kind of speaking makes me realize my place. It helps me to see how I should see. It helps me to realize my position in relationship to God. When God says what he says here in this verse, Isaiah 66 and verse 1, he's trying to help people to see where they stand in relationship to him. He's creator, their creature. (laughs) The heaven, the heavens are his throne. The earth is his footstool. And he's like, where are you going to build a house for me, guys? Or in other words, the house that you built for me, it was illustrative of larger truths. It was, this, it, was, it was something I told you to build, not because I needed a place to reside, guys. It, it, it was a place where I could teach you how I was going to reconcile you to myself. I didn't need you to build me a house, you know. If you think that God needs you to build him a house, then you don't think much of God. And the fact of the matter is, is that his Old Testament people didn't think much of him. They thought that, that, that he needed them to build him a house. And he's like, I don't need you to build me a house, okay? Understand your position in relationship to me. Understand your play. Verse 2, for my hand made all these things. Thus, all these things came into being, declares the Lord. Now, how bizarre is it for creatures, small and limited, building a house for God out of materials that he brought into existence? Now, it's a beautiful thing to build God a house when you realize that you're doing it because God wants a meeting place where you and he can meet together and commune and relate. So him asking his people to build him a house wasn't because he needed a house. It was because he wanted them to make a place for him in their hearts and in their minds. And he wanted them to know his ways and to teach them. So it was for their sakes, not his sakes, that they built him a house, but they didn't get it. And and you're going to see they didn't get it. And you see it all through the book of Isaiah that they didn't get it. But you're going to see that in what he goes on to say. And he talks about 
how they make sacrifices, but their sacrifices are useless because they're doing the right thing in, in worshiping the way that he prescribed them to worship, but they're not doing it the right way. They're not relating to the worship correctly. This lesson brings out the fact, and really that's the rest of this passage that the lesson starts from. In Isaiah 66, 1 through 19 is the passage of scripture this day wants us to focus in on. And for the rest of this passage, you just see God is, is finding fault with how they want to relate to him. So the lesson asks this question, and I want to highlight this, and then I'm going to brief you through the rest of this week's quarterly, and we're done. Not that you want to be done, not that I want to be done, but we've got lives to live. Okay, in Isaiah 66, 3, God says, through Isaiah, but he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like the one who breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is like the one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol. And they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. Wow, crazy. So the question that the lesson brings up is, what is this text saying? We've talked a little bit about what this text is saying. What spiritual principles are being revealed here? How might the same idea be expressed but in the context of contemporary Christianity and worship? Okay, so they're worshiping, they're bringing their lambs, they're bringing their other offerings, and God is saying, it's as if they are doing these other things that are abominable to me. Prior to this verse, the end of verse 2, God says, I look on those who are humble and have a contrite spirit and who tremble at my word, who have a proper regard for the things that I say and who understand their place and they understand my place in the grand scheme of things. But my people by and large are worshiping, but not the right way. They're not relating the right way to this worship. It's just formalistic. It's just ritualistic. It's as if they think that by doing these rituals, they're going to like command my presence. They're the initiators. They're the ones who are doing something for me. As compared to, they're just simply responding to my initiation. Now, God is the great initiator of everything. He's the creator of everything. He's the creator of life. He is the redeemer of the human race. God is all in all. And the people were building him how they built his house and they're assuming that he needed them to do that. They're making these sacrifices as if he's lucky to have them bringing him goats. You know, it's like, and he's looking at them saying, guys, you might as well be pouring pig blood out the way you're worshiping me because this is useless. This is ridiculous. You're, you're acting like the pagans. The pagans think that they can command the spirits, that they can come up with these rituals and these rituals will allow them to conjure up the supernatural. And it, it's if they start and end with themselves because they think that they're the gods. You know, it's, it's not right. It's just twisted and sick and my people are functioning the same way. And so the lesson brings up th this really interesting point. It says, in principle, what does this passage communicate with modern contemporary Christianity and its worship? Well, there's nothing new under the sun. Things may change shape, but basically they stay the same. The same issues arise time after time after time through time. Nothing new under the sun. So the pagans, they had their rituals, their services, their humming, their chanting, their gesticulations. They had all of the things that they would do. And they thought that once they did these things, they would enter into the divine presence. They would recommend themselves to God. They would bring themselves into God and they would bring God down to them through these rituals and through these services. And this is typified by the prophets of Baal on the mountain of Carmel when they were having a showdown with God's prophet Elijah. And they're cutting themselves and they're dancing and they're singing and they're shouting and they're doing all of this stuff. And they're doing it because they think that the ritual is going to call down the power and presence of their God. Uh, but it's not. But what Elijah does is because he has a real connection with God and he's really obedient to God and he really follows God as he says a simple prayer. And the fire comes down. And the fire comes down. He has always related to God as if God is God and he is a small little man. And he has always realized that God is too big uh, to honor with any monument that a man could make. He can make the most ma magnificent structure that a man could ever make, and it would be utterly insignificant to house the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the God of the universe. And so he never, ever, ever supposed that he could do that. He was humble and he feared at God's word. And so when he said a simple prayer, the power of God came down in the form of the fire and consumed the sacrifice. And so I'm saying these things, guys, because there's so much, there's so much I'm sure the Spirit of God is saying to you now as I'm speaking. In the modern era, do we have ritualistic Jews who 
are very careful and meticulous about their worship, but it's really meaningless to them. Yes, we have that, that they had that in those days. Do we had, have uh, ritualistic worship in the Christian church that's more an ancient pagan sacrificial system? Yeah, where it's based upon dazzling the senses rather than speaking to the conscience. Of course, the modern neo-Pentecostal movements that are afoot in Christianity for the last 50 years, that's fully, it's like we're going to create this environment within which you can feel like you're in the presence of God. That's not altogether bad, right? Because there's nothing wrong with creating an environment that's conducive to worshiping God. But if you take that too far, then you become a pagan and you're just worshiping the perception of your senses. And you're bringing God down to a level that he shouldn't be brought down to. So it's as if you're just like, I'll just play this music, make the, you turn on the lights to this degree, have some laser beams and make a kind of a spacey, airy feeling in the room and, and everyone will feel like they're in God's presence. And you heighten and dazzle the senses and you make people suppose that now they've encountered God. Well, well, all they encountered was an electric guitar and some beautiful music. Like, that's cool. But if you can command the Holy Spirit by electric guitars, oh boy, who do you think you are? That's crazy. What happens when the electricity goes out? And so, I'm not against, I'm personally not against electric guitars. I'm really not. I'm not even against, like, turning the lights down and all this stuff. But thinking that that's the thing that, like, guarantees that God will be there. That's pagan, straight up. And that's kind of what God is addressing here with his people. So let's, let's avoid that. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will send you the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you love God? Well, we love God because he first loved us. And while we were enemies, God died for the, un Jesus died for the ungodly, right? You have to learn of him. He's meek and lowly of heart. The Holy Spirit teaches you and he guides you into truth and he testifies to you of Jesus. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They gave us the scriptures. We read the scriptures. We study. We get to know Jesus for who he is. And then we love him and we keep his commandments. And then as, as, as we follow him, the great initiator, uh, the, the Lord of our life, the Lord of our salvation, as we follow him, then we get the Holy Spirit. But we don't like develop some worship system that like, triggers God into giving us his spirit. That's so pagan. That's so pagan. I'm going to say something bold here. The abomination of Pentecostalism is not the music style. I don't care if my, my conservative friends don't like me for saying that. Like, there's no chapter and verse that, that describes what holy music sounds like. Like, it's just not there. I don't think that all music is okay music, but at the same time, there's no genre that's more holy than others. It's not a prescribed holy genre. Did Ellen White forget to give to prescribe to us a certain score that was, was acceptable to God? So I don't think that the, the thing wrong with Pentecostalism is that the music that they play is intrinsically evil or electric guitars are intrinsically satanic. I'm not into that thinking. What's wrong with Pentecostalism is that it bases faith upon the demonstration of senses. So my faith is based upon what my senses tell me. And that's a danger. That's a danger. That's what's wrong with Pentecostalism. And by the way, that's what's wrong with formalistic Adventist worship. And you think, and I think that formalism is just like on the conservative side of the spectrum, but it's not. Formalism is on the liberal side of the spectrum. It's, it for, formalism is just formalism. Uh, it can take various forms. You can have a conservative form of formalism or a liberal form of formalism. I've been to Pentecostal churches that are very formal. It's just the same form, the same rite, the same ritual. It's just ritualistic formalism. God requires heart worship, but how can you love him unless you know him? And how can you know him unless you've been taught through word and deed? Jesus calls the 12. He goes out into communities. He teaches the kingdom of God and he shows them what the kingdom of God looks like by living it out. This is how people learn of the kingdom. This is how people learn to love the kingdom and the, follow, the, the power of the spirit, miraculous manifestations follow that. But you don't just like jump around with really nice music for a long time and then, oh, we got the spirit and there's miracles now. And then, oh, we've got the power of God. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. We're going to end right here, guys, the lesson, but just um, a, a few final words. Rebirth of chant planet Earth. That's the title of the lesson. New heavens and new earth. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth as soon as there's a new humanity. And this is what the Bible teaches. Uh, God, he warns us against worship, that even though it may be done in God's name, to, to God's honor, it's done with arrogance and with pride and without people realizing their place before God and not 
understanding God's grandeur and God's true greatness. Further to this, the lesson goes on to talk about the missionary spirit that God wanted to possess his people. And Isaiah even makes a prediction about how foreigners would become priests in Israel. And the lesson talks about how the Christian church realized this more fully than Judaism ever did. And in the Christian church, in the Christian faith, we're one family irrespective of race, ethnicity, culture, our sex, although it separates us physiologically and does consign us to certain functions and roles, this is just nature. We all have equal access to God, and we're all brothers and sisters, equally saved through the blood of the Lamb. The Bible teaches this, and we, we now in the Christian church, there's a wall of partition torn down, and there is no distinct ethnic group that has been given the oracles of God, but God through the Christian church is accessing everyone and reaching everyone, and everyone is in. And this was God's, really, this was God's ideal for Israel. And there's more to say, guys, but we're out of time. It's been a pleasure to chat with you and spend time with you, but to, it was great to spend some time with you guys considering some of the points brought out by this week's lesson. I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit has really led us now, and I pray that you will be a little bit more motivated to study scripture, study your, your lesson, and have a great time at Sabbath school this week. May God bless you, may God keep you, and may God strengthen you as we continue to march forward in faith towards the close of this world's history when everything will be made new. I look forward to that day because I'm getting older and I wanna live forever because just one life is not enough. Just 60 years is not enough. Just 600 years is not enough. Just 6,000 years is not enough. You could live for a million years, but come to the end of a million years and think, it's over, it's done. Our lives will measure with the life of God if we have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we believe on Jesus, that he died for us, was raised for us, and that now he stands for us before the throne of God. And if we deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him, our salvation is sure. We will be in the promised land, in the earth made new. May God get us there. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.